Welcome to another Big Train Tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This month, we'll be taking a look at some of the tank cars that helped fuel Colorado. Built to the standard railroad gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches, and later converted to three foot narrow gauge for service on the Denver and Rio Grande Western, these cars were part of a small fleet serving several regional oil producers in the Rocky Mountain region. Today, these artifacts of the early automobile age are proudly displayed at the museum, representing the railroad's role in transforming 20th century energy use and transportation modes in Colorado. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject today is a seemingly unremarkable type of freight car, built specifically to carry petroleum products in our case. The tank cars we'll be exploring were constructed in the early years of the 20th century, themselves pioneers of improved design and built to serve on America's network of standard gauge railroads. Converted in the 1920s and 1930s to narrow gauge, they would continue dutifully in Colorado and New Mexico for several more decades. But changes in the transportation of crude oil would ultimately lead to obsolescence, helped along by untimely bad luck. Come join me now as we explore the subject of fueling Colorado and some of the tank cars which made up that story's supporting cast. The commercial discovery of oil in the late 1850s and the need for a method to transport the resulting liquid gold launched the development of what we know today as the railroad tank car. The earliest known shipment of crude oil by rail took place in Pennsylvania in 1862 as the Civil War was raging. This first shipment consisted of individual wooden barrels of oil loaded onto a flat car. Just three years earlier, the first commercially drilled oil well near Titusville, Pennsylvania, had launched a first wave of investment in oil drilling, marketing, and refining. By 1865, the first ever railroad tank cars had been developed for use. These were known as tub cars because of their vertically mounted wooden tubs. The next step was to create longer horizontal wooden tanks and to mount these on flat cars. In 1869, the same year the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, the railroad tank car began to take on its modern form. Riveted iron tanks, featuring a central dome for access and loading, were mounted horizontally onto flat cars. The railroad tank car would grow in size and capacity over time, and its construction would change from iron and wood to steel. The practice of attaching a tank to a flat car would evolve into tanks being directly affixed to steel underframes for safety and durability. So-called frameless versions were being designed even prior to 1910, in which the tank itself became the structure that carried the forces of train movement. Welding replaced riveting as the method of structural fastening beginning in the 1920s and 1930s, leading to more improvements and the ability to carry a wider variety of cargoes often under pressure. Today, railroad tank cars are in service to carry a mind-boggling variety of liquids, including crude oil and other petroleum products, corn syrup, highly corrosive acids, and even liquefied refrigerated gases. The corporate environment of tank cars also has relevance to our story. Beginning just after development of the first railroad tank cars in the early 1860s, private companies were created to supply tank cars for shipping oil. The Star Tank Lines was one of the earliest of these leasing companies, dating from 1866. Founded by one of Standard Oil Company's early competitors, the Star Tank Line shipped oil from the fields of Pennsylvania to Chicago for refining. Star Tank was purchased by John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil in 1873, and its headquarters moved to Ohio. Five years later, its name was changed to Union Tank Car Company. By 1904, Union Tank owned a fleet of 10,000 cars, far more than any other private car operator. 
It shipped products solely for its parent company, Standard Oil, until 1911 when the Standard Oil Trust was dissolved by the federal government because of its monopoly over the oil industry. As a separate company now leasing tank cars to other oil producers, Union Tank Lines grew in the 1920s to a fleet of some 30,000 cars, with its headquarters now in Chicago. Colorado's extensive network of narrow-gauge railroads once hosted a wide variety of tank cars. The Continental Oil Company of Oklahoma, known as Conoco, assembled a broad array of cars, ranging from older style tanks on flat cars to more modern cars with steel channel underframes. These cars operated on the Colorado and Southern in Central Colorado, the Rio Grande Southern in Southwestern Colorado, and all across the far-flung Denver and Rio Grande Western system. Sometimes these tank cars carried the big Conoco lettering, helping to advertise the brand throughout the Centennial State. Another oil producer, the Texas Oil Company, known as Texaco, owned a smaller number of narrow-gauge cars, including some larger double-domed models. There was at least one other small operator for a time, but the largest owner of narrow-gauge tank cars by far in Colorado was Union Tank Car Company with reporting marks UTLX appearing on its many cars. The company's narrow-gauge operations started in 1924 with just 25 tank cars. These cars were converted by Union Tank from older 6,500-gallon standard-gauge tank cars, with the frames being revised before the cars were shipped to Alamosa. There, the Denver and Rio Grande installed narrow-gauge trucks, also furnished by Union Tank. These newly regaged cars were placed in service on the Rio Grande narrow-gauge system, transporting crude from new oil fields near Farmington, New Mexico, up to Durango. From Durango, the cars would move via the Rio Grande Southern to Ridgeway, where they were turned back over to the Rio Grande for the short trip to Montrose. In Montrose, the contents of these cars would then be pumped into standard gauge tank cars for the final leg of the trip to refineries in Salt Lake City. One of these early trains was photographed complete with promotional banners en route from Farmington circa 1924. The oil business grew busier, and in spite of the first refineries coming online in the Farmington region, crude oil still needed to be shipped by rail to other locations and refineries. Between 1927 and 1930, more cars were converted for transporting crude on the Rio Grande narrow gauge network, mostly out of Farmington. In 1937, the Gilmore Oil Company of Los Angeles arranged to lease 25 cars from Union Tank Car Company. These cars were needed to help with the paving of US Highway 160, which at the time was being extended west from Walsenburg, Colorado, to Utah. Legend tells us that the tank cars were shipped on their standard gauge wheels to Alamosa, already loaded with road oil. In Alamosa, these cars were retrucked by the Rio Grande with narrow gauge wheel sets. Unlike the earlier tank cars brought to Colorado for narrow gauging, these cars were of a frameless design pioneered in the early 20th century by Union Tank Car engineer John Van Dyke. Known as Type V or Van Dyke cars, these cars were constructed with strengthened steel plates shaped to match the circumference of the tank and attached directly to the bottom of the tank itself. This in turn created a frame or platform to which couplers, brake rigging, bolsters, and trucks or wheel sets could be attached. The Highway 160 paving project continued over the next several years, creating a new highway that would ultimately help put the railroad itself out of business in the years to come. Additional cars of the same type were brought in for this project at several different times, briefly narrow-gauged, and then returned to standard gauge just a few months later. All of these cars were equipped with heater coils in the tanks to keep the contents warm so the thick road oil would remain liquid. A couple years later in 1939-40, the Rio Grande insisted that the original 25 frameless cars needed higher capacity wheel sets. Union Tank responded by providing new cast steel trucks, which the railroad then installed under these frameless tank cars. In 
Around the same time, 14 of the frameless cars were leased for dedicated service on the Denver and Rio Grande Western. The owner of a newly constructed small oil refinery in Alamosa, Mr. Lafayette Hughes, needed to move crude oil from a newly developed oil field near Chama, New Mexico. Most, but not all, of the 14 cars were lettered with a brand name that would become well known, Gramps. The formal name of his company was Gramps Oil and Refining, and as the story goes, Mr. Hughes wanted his grandchildren to know which tank cars were his when they saw oil being moved by rail. The Gramps oil field, which was actually located on the west side of the Continental Divide outside of Chama, featured a gravity siphon pipeline carrying crude oil to the Rio Grande's Chama Railroad Yard. There, a loading dock was constructed to enable the filling of tank cars also by gravity. In Alamosa, on the other end of the route, an unloading dock was established adjacent to the Gramps refinery and close by the railroad's dual gauge shop, roundhouse, and yard complex. A continuous process of filling in Chama, transporting the loaded cars to Alamosa, unloading, and returning to Chama for refilling then began. This would continue for a quarter of a century. When they were first delivered for narrow gauge service, these cars retained their original standard gauge numbers. They served dutifully throughout World War II, when pretty much every available railroad tank car in the U.S. was pressed into service to carry oil and petroleum products. Renumbered in 1947, according to the type of heater each car was equipped with, these tank cars were joined by another 10 of the same type that were temporarily brought in for another round of Colorado State Highway Department paving projects. Just nine years later, the remaining 23 cars of this frameless design were given what would be their final renumberings. Oil refineries were brought online in the Farmington region within just a few years of oil first being discovered there. Nonetheless, petroleum products continued to be transported from Farmington north to Durango and from there north and east via the Rio Grande Southern and Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroads. Some oil from the Farmington area even moved as far east as Alamosa for refining after the establishment of the refinery there in the late 1930s. Disruptions with rail traffic via the Rio Grande Southern from Durango north to Ridgeway happened increasingly in the 1930s and 1940s, and by 1951, the Rio Grande Southern had ceased operations completely. Oil-related traffic between Alamosa and Farmington had a rebirth in the 1940s. More discoveries near Farmington prompted the building of pipelines to carry oil and natural gas to Albuquerque and Southern California. The Denver and Rio Grande Western was kept busy bringing pipe to Farmington, utilizing gondola cars interspersed with idler flat cars due to the long lengths of pipe that were involved. This traffic continued into the early 1960s, but declined sharply as the pipelines were completed and as highways in and around southwestern Colorado continued to improve. The Gramps oil field continued to furnish a steady supply of crude oil to Chama, through the 1940s and 1950s, and trains with sometimes over a dozen tank cars made the trip every few days. These trains climbed from Chama on a 4% grade to 10,000 foot Cumbres Pass, then headed downgrade through a high country landscape via Toltec Gorge to Antonito, and then north to Alamosa, where they were spotted for unloading opposite the Alamosa yards. As other rail shippers moved their business to trucks or simply ceased operating in the 1950s and early 1960s, oil traffic became increasingly important to the future of the Rio Grande narrow gauge system. The Gramps oil trains soldiered on through the winter of 1963, then the unthinkable happened. A fire at the Alamosa refinery led to its permanent shutdown in the fall of 1964. The crude oil from Chama would now move by truck to Farmington for refining. Suddenly, this beacon of hope for Colorado narrow-gauge railroading had been snuffed out.
By 1962, most petroleum traffic had left the shrinking narrow gauge system, with the Gramps service being the final holdout. That year, 16 of the narrow frame Union tank cars were sold to the White Pass and Yukon Narrow Gauge Railroad in Alaska. Several of this same design had been sold off earlier to a variety of railroads, including the Sumter Valley in Oregon and also the Denver and Rio Grande Western, for use as auxiliary water cars for rotary snowplows. The remaining cars of this design were sold for scrap the following year, in 1963. With the closing of the Alamosa refinery in 1964, the 23 remaining frameless design Union tank cars were sold to a scrapyard in Lajara, located midway between Alamosa and Antonito. Interestingly, 16 pairs of trucks from these cars would end up going to Alaska, installed on the narrow frame cars purchased by the White Pass and Yukon. The reason was simple. These wheel sets were of an improved and more modern design than those originally installed under the earlier narrow frame tank cars. Colorado Railroad Museum founder Bob Richardson would also purchase eight pairs of these trucks from the frameless tank cars. But why does any of this matter? Well, several of these cars have been preserved today. They can be found in Colorado, Oregon, Alaska, even British Columbia, Canada. Here at the Colorado Railroad Museum, we're fortunate to have ended up with examples of both the frameless and narrow frame versions, thanks to efforts to acquire tanks well after they had been separated from their wheel sets in the mid-1960s. The museum also was a participant in efforts to return several of the former Union tank cars to Colorado from Alaska, after the White Pass and Yukon ceased freight operations in the early 1980s. Today, the Colorado Railroad Museum proudly displays two of the former Union Tank frameless cars. These pioneering railroad cars date from 1911 and 1912. Of these, the first was never lettered with the Gramps brand name, so it carries the UTLX lettering with its Colorado service number 88177 on one side and 11058 on the other. Frameless tank car number 11045, which is known to have proudly carried the Gramps brand name during its service years, has a more storied history. It was acquired by the museum when the assets of a failed Colorado tourist railroad operation, the Sundown and Southern, were sold off in the early 2000s. Missing many parts, lacking the central dome, and requiring the reconstruction of its ends, which had been modified, this car has seen restoration work on and off for several years. In spring 2021, this favorite of rail enthusiasts and modelers alike will finally be emerging from the Colorado Railroad Museum's roundhouse, freshly overhauled and repainted. It will once again sport the popular Gramps brand name, recalling its years of transporting crude oil between Chama and Alamosa. Also found in the museum's collection is narrow frame Union tank car number 12770. This is the oldest tank car at the museum, dating from 1907, fairly early for an all-steel railroad car. For comparison, consider that the very first all-steel freight cars were constructed in the U.S. in the late 1890s, and the nation's first all-steel passenger cars in 1906. This car was acquired as part of the previously mentioned effort to return former narrow frame, three foot gauge Union tank cars to Colorado from Alaska. Received in 1992 and refurbished starting that same year, this car is today repainted and re-lettered back to its Union tank car appearance, showcasing its colorful years of Colorado narrow gauge service. More appropriate arch bar trucks recently were substituted for the cast steel ones that were added when the car first traveled to Alaska. Thanks for joining me today. Colorado's railroads have played critical roles in moving fuel and energy to power a growing state, and they continue to do so today. I hope you've enjoyed our quick look at fueling the Centennial State via narrow gauge tank cars and the full-sized reminders that have been preserved from this era, especially our newly restored Gramps tank car. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections. Like, comment, share, and subscribe.
commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.